Continuing with the theme of the things on which the devil feeds, the devil's diet, we come to now, or we now come to a topic which is very, very important. It's called, I'm entitling this message, The Devil's Diet, Your Self Salvation. The salvation which you, whoever, attempts to obtain by your own efforts. Naturally, you see, as people, we have desires, we have abilities, we have strengths, we have willpower, etc. And because Scripture tells us that God has placed eternity into the hearts of people, there is this desire in the vast, vast majority of people, unless they suppress that in unrighteousness, that make a choice to just put the lid on that, but there are, there are not many people like that, deep down. People want to know where they're going, both in this life, what does tomorrow hold for me, and also in the life to come, the future. You see, we want to know that as people. And we, because we are people with abilities, with desires, with willpower, etc., we want to help ourselves to get there. But that's not the way it works, is it? in God's salvation plan. That we, as people, to achieve our objective, which for the vast majority of people is to go to heaven. That's what they say. I'm, I'm going to heaven because I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not a bad person. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. They think by their own efforts, by their own goodness, by their own standards, which they try to keep, they are going to obtain this self-salvation. And it's on this that the devil feeds. This is part of the devil's diet. He absolutely loves it. When people think that they can earn their way to heaven, they can somehow manipulate their way to heaven, they can <clears throat> achieve this eternal life through their own efforts. But it's not so. That's not what the Bible says. It's maybe what people want to believe, but it's not what the Holy Bible says. This is not what God says. Let's look at some scripture. I, This thought came to my mind just a, a very short while ago today when I started to read Psalm 27. Psalm 27. I didn't get very far with Psalm 27. In fact, pretty much the first verse, well actually the first half of the first verse. Psalm 27 verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? That's what I read just a little while ago today and I thought, wow, people want a light, people want salvation, people endeavour to obtain this self-salvation and that is where the devil feeds because it's all about self. It's all about me achieving my objective. It's all about me, me, me doing this or that, or me not doing this or that, in order to get right with God, in order to approach God so that we can get to heaven. N-O, no. That doesn't work like that, as we know from Scripture. And I put an emphasis on this when I read it, because we all want light rather than darkness, do we not? Although there are some people, I guess, who would want to operate in the dark, but they are in the very small minority. And deep down, I truly believe, from my understanding of Scripture, and because God has placed eternity in the hearts of people, that people want a light, they want a good future, they want hope, they want salvation, they want to get to heaven. And I put an emphasis on this. I said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So that answers the question. Easy, full stop. Who is my light or what is my light? Who is my salvation or what is my salvation? The answer is the Lord. 
Yahweh, as we would refer to him maybe in these scriptures in the Psalms. Jesus is God. He always has been. He always will be. His name, Yeshua, means the Lord saves. Who saves? Do we save ourselves? Are we capable of self-salvation? No, we are not. So who saves? The Lord saves. Yeshua, Jesus, that is the person. He is our salvation. And it, it really is as simple as that. Yet people somehow allow themselves to be deluded by the diet which actually Satan gives them and from which he then feeds. You see, he is a sustainer because he, he uh, propagates and allows his doctrine of self-salvation to grow in people, to flourish in people. He nurtures it and then he feeds on it. Self-salvation is very much part of the devil's diet. So I read it like that. I, the Lord is my light and my salvation. That's one way to read it, putting the emphasis on light and salvation. But I put it the other way. I put the Lord is my light and my salvation. Quite simple, isn't it? A couple of references in Isaiah. We'll just skip through these fairly quickly before we go on to other scriptures. The book of Isaiah. Well, the book of Isaiah, I can't paraphrase it in one or two sentences, but there's a lot of prophecy in Isaiah. He spoke to the people of his day, but he also spoke regarding the future. And indeed for us here in the year 2024, he spoke into our future. What is going to be happening? That which has not yet happened. In Isaiah chapter 12, and in that day you will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you will comfort and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. Isaiah 12 verses 1 and just beginning of verse 2. Behold, God, God is my salvation. Not me. I am not my salvation. I can't save myself. I can't save anybody else. It is God through the merits of the Lord Jesus, through the atoning death of the Lord Jesus, through the sacrificial giving up of his life of the Lord Jesus, giving his life's blood on that cross at Calvary that allows me to be forgiven because of my trust, my faith in what Jesus did, and I have abandoned any faith in me. You see, part of this devil's diet, your self-salvation is having faith in yourself. Maybe I might deal with that in a later video. I'm not sure. That thought just came to me. Faith in oneself to achieve salvation, useless. Isaiah chapter 25. I've just flicked over a few pages here in my Bible. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 25, just coming, coming in at verse 8. He, that's referring to the Lord, he will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken and it will be in that day and, and it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. He will save us. This is, our, this is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Now, th these, these, it's a principle which runs throughout all of scripture that salvation, rescue, redemption, deliverance comes from God. And we cannot engineer this. We cannot make this happen. It's a matter of faith and trust and coming to God, asking for his salvation. Jeremiah. <clears throat> Let's move a little further. A few more pages here over in my Bible. Jeremiah chapter three and 
just one verse, I think. We can take this as a standalone verse and extract the principle from it. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 23. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Now I know in context, and we have to always bear in mind the context, in context, God was speaking through Isaac, through Jeremiah, to his people, Israel. Yes, they are still his people. He has not abandoned them. We have joined in with the, um, the commonwealth of Israel, if you like, the, the Jewish root. We have joined as Christians. We've been grafted in and God has not forsaken his people. But the principle to be taken from here, although the reference is made to his people Israel, is that it is vain, it's vanity, it's useless to hope for salvation from the hills, it says, from any direction, from anywhere. Truly, in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. It's no good looking at anywhere else or to anyone else for our salvation. Truly, in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. It's in God. It's in the Lord. It's his salvation. Turning over quite a number of pages here now in my scriptures, I come to Ephesians. We have two more scriptures to look at. As if it's not already clear, it is already clear, but let's just, let me just reinforce the point here from scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, and, well, where can we start? Let's start at verse 13. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 onwards. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were, who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So it's in Christ Jesus we've been brought near, not by our own efforts. It's, but now in Christ Jesus... You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. The, the one new man is Jew and Gentile, come together in one, in Christ. Verse 17, no, verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So who was it who, who, who effected, who brought about this reconciliation? Does it say that we can do that by our efforts, by our good deeds, by our good works, by our charitable thinking? No. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile to God, the Father, in one body because of the cross, because of his sacrifice on the cross. The final scripture is over a few, just a few pages more in Colossians, the letter to the Colossians, chapter one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And ah, where should we begin here? Probably verse 19, just reading the two verses in one Colossians, verses 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father that in him, that's in Jesus, Yeshua, salvation, the Lord saves. For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. And by him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. That's another verse, 21. I read verses 19, 20, 21. So the reconciliation has been effected by the Lord Jesus. 
says in verse 20, by him, by his cross, by his blood, he has brought about peace. He's brought about peace and reconciliation between sinful mankind and a holy, perfect, precious God. But it's based on trust. That is how it has to be, because we were once alienated and enemies in our minds. And that's the situation of people who are not born again. They are alienated from God, enemies of God in their mind. No matter what they think, their position is that that's what Scripture says. And it's all done through Christ and his blood on the cross that he gave, his life's blood he gave up to allow this reconciliation. And you see, people who try this process of self-salvation, on which the devil very much feeds, it's a total denial of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross when he gave his blood. It, it makes out of no effect. And that's shocking, isn't it? That's terrible. Maybe, I don't know, what do you think? Maybe that's almost blasphemous to think that we can do it ourselves and therefore what the Lord Jesus did doesn't matter. It doesn't count. It, it doesn't work. That's what this doctrine of self-salvation actually means. It's speaking against God. It's saying that, well, Jesus was a good man. OK, I'm prepared to believe that Jesus was indeed God, but it, it, what he did doesn't bring me salvation. I've got to do it myself. That's a dangerous, dangerous philosophy to hold. And that's why the devil feeds on it. And that's why I've called this particular video message, The Devil's Diet, Your Self-Salvation. Because it not only doesn't work, but it actually feeds the devil. Oh, how I wish that people would just give up on this idea that the way to the Father in heaven, the way to heaven is through our own goodness and doings. It's not. And I trust that by the few scriptures that I've been able to look through today, I trust that it is abundantly clear, patently clear, crystal clear, that it's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to take our sin upon him, to take our punishment, to give his life's blood, that it's through that act of redemption and that act of redemption and salvation only that we can ob obtain salvation. And why we must put our absolute trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and not on any effort of self-salvation.